<laughs> All right, tonight we're going to be looking at, in our series, The Pioneers of Faith. We're going to be looking at John Alexander Dowie. And you reason probably, the, the reason why you probably haven't heard much about this guy or even heard of him at all is because he's a very controversial figure. And if there wasn't so much documentation on his life and that even the secular media went after him, but also if you do any type of um, YouTube search on him, there's this one particular video, it's pretty lengthy, but it shows you all the clippings from the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune. Um, they went after this guy and wrote everything they could possibly, we'll, and we'll get into that, but there's so much documentation of the healings that took place, even the newspaper articles were talking about the actual healings. So when you've got, um, if there was no documentation, you'll see why he's controversial. Um, but he's a very interesting individual, and so um, not many people, like I said, have heard of him because of his ministry ended, not only was it controversial, but it ended in a tragedy, and we'll get to that here shortly. Um, he truly manifested the kingdom of God on earth, primarily in the area of divine healing. Hundreds of thousands were converted and healed, yet his ministry did not end well. Against all hypocritical, exposing, opposing ministers, slanderous tabloids, murderous mobs, and relentless city officials, he wore his apostolic calling as a crown from God and his persecution as a badge of honor. Now, he's born in May 25th, 1847 in Edinburgh, Scotland. Born in poverty. His school attendance was irregular because he had this major... Um, um, illness that um, kept him out of school. His parents basically was grooming him for the ministry at a, very, at a very young age and at the age of six this guy, this kid, reads through the whole Bible at the, at the, at the age of six and um, at the age of seven he gets a call to the ministry so God apprehended him at a very very early age but he really didn't do anything because when you get to the, when he gets to about age 13 his parents leave for Australia, leave Scotland, and go to Australia. And there he begins to work for his uncle in a shoe factory. And then went on from there to work menial tasks. Um, his peers began to notice that he was more than ordinary, and um, he became a, a young businessman and an assistant to a firm. And, um, and that particular firm made $2 million a year. That is a lot of money for that time. All right, so, um, you know, that was good for him. But again, there's that call lingering over him. So through these years of climbing the occupational ladder, God was continually, um, min God was continually ministering to his heart and constantly tugging him towards the call he got when he was seven. But one of his pet peeves, he stayed in church. He was always um, in church. But one of his pet peeves was that many of the clergy in the area was refusing or neglecting to teach on certain areas. But the one that was closest to his heart was divine healing because he was sick. He had a chronic illness. And um, he was still suffering from that. He had a severe indigestion problem that plagued him all up through his teens, years, and on. And after reading the will of God concerning healing, he petitioned the Lord and was completely delivered of that affliction. And this divine manifestation was only a token of the revelation that was to come in his life. So at the age of 21, he made an absolute decision to answer the call of God, and he would take all the money that he saved from his occupations and began studying under a private tutor to prepare for the ministry. Fifteen months later, he left Australia to enroll in Edinburgh, back to where he was from, a university, to study um, in the free church school there. Majoring in theology and political science, he was not regarded as a model student because of his disagreement with the professors and their doctrines. It was always a pain in their rear. And while in Edinburgh, he became the honorary chaplain of the um, Edinburgh Infirmary. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Um, because he, his heart was close to divine healing, because he had been divinely healed, um, they didn't know what to do with him, so they put him as a chaplain in this hospital. 
And because he's so smart and intelligent, he was able to rub shoulders with the doctors. And um, so while he was there, um, he sat under the most famous surgeons of the day, comparing their diagnosis with the Word of God. Dowie heard the surgeon's lecture on their, because he was behind the scenes working there, he heard their, med, um, he heard their lectures on their medical inadequacies. Inadequacies. It was then that he realized these surgeons could not heal and that they could only resort to removing the diseased organs, hoping for a cure. He watched many surgeons and with deadly results as he heard from the lips of these medical professors the confession that they were only guessing in the dark with what they were doing. Now, this is when but the medical is primitive. It's not like it is today. But, um, but, he's, but when, you, when you get into the, again, I'm only highlighting but if you really go into detail about his life, he, he really talks a lot about that. That he would see what these surgeons were doing, hearing their lectures, l listening to them talking behind the scenes, then going in there, attending to the, to the people as a chaplain, suffering and what being butchered, and it just really affected him. And again, that's just the times. It's not so much he was against the medical, though many will say that he was, but I think he was against it because it just what it was primitive. It just wasn't. They were, they were giving hope to these people, but butchering them up, and many were dying, suffering. But as any of us, that would bother you. When you would go and hear that the doctors were saying, we don't know what we're doing, then why are you continuing to do to the people what you're doing? So that's a dilemma that he had to deal with. And he, however he ended, whatever, wherever he landed on it, he did. Many of us may, may feel differently, or others would see it differently. But anyway, that's what, that was his dilemma. And... Um, so he was able to see things behind the scenes. This put more of a desire for divine healing for, for suffering people and uh, that were plagued with sickness. Now, returning to Australia, he accepted an invitation to pastor the Congregational Church in Alma, Australia. His style of preaching and their lethargy was not a good combination. He soon resigned from that within a year, in spite of the fact that he needed the money. He just couldn't take it anymore. Soon after his resignation, he was asked to pastor another church in Manly Beach, Australia. Once again, he was distraught over their lack of passion and their insensitivity to the Word of God, but this time he stayed, taking that extra time to, to continue his studies. Soon a larger church opened up to him in Newton and um, in Sydney, so in 1875, Dowie moved again. Um, while pastoring in Newton, a plague swept through the region at that church that he just started. And some think it was a tuberculosis, it was, uh, but we really don't know for sure what kind of plague that it was. But it was on the outskirts of Sydney and people were dying at a high rate. And he was doing funerals left and right. Pastors were dying and he had to do the funerals of the pastors. And so it was a plague that was um, really devastating at that time. So while visiting in a hospital, a young girl um, was there, and the, the mother asked Dowie to come to pray. Well, he was, while he was in there, the doctor was in there, and she was, she was ready to die. And the doctor said, I got, I got to go. So the doctor filled out everything and told Dowie, said, look, all you got to do is fill, I've left every, I filled everything in except for the, uh, the, uh, the blank of the time of death. And since you're going to be here, I got to go. Could you, you know, when she dies, fill that in and then give it to the nurse? He's like, I'm not doing that. And he goes, why not? He said, because I don't believe she's going to die. So he just left it there and the doctor left. And so um, he asked the mother, why, why did you, why'd you call me to come here? She goes, because we're all, we, we got nothing else. They, they said she's going to die. We thought we would call you to pray. And the girl rose up and said, yeah, please pray. She's, you know, half out of it. So he prayed and, um, again, documented because the doctor was there saying she's, she's going to die any time, but i got to go. Fill in the, you know, the time of death. So he prays for her, and within minutes to an hour, she's up drinking hot chocolate, eating toast, and perfectly fine. And so, again, documented, and uh, God began to start using him in the area of healing. And so he ends up getting married in May. Oh, yeah. So he goes back to his church after healing the girl. He goes back to his church and starts healing people and starts proclaiming health and all that. And nobody else died. People were still dying, but in his church, nobody died. From that point on, 
Nobody died in this church from that plague. So anyway, he gets married in eight, May, May 26, 1876, and um, still financially dealing in some hardship because poverty was bad during then. So during this time, he made a decision to leave the denomination that he was in because he had different, he met, had different, uh, many differences with them, and um, he was just burning to proclaim divine healing and wanted to minister throughout the city. His congregation of that church had grown to over twice the size. It was already large when he got it, but it grew twice the size of the others. But his success, his success spoke to deaf ears, and he was constantly fighting through the politics and letter of the law theology that threatened to dampen his faith. He finally broke free from the denomination in 1878, and, um, and he secured the Royal Theater in Sydney to begin an independent ministry. But once again, the lack of funds halted his work. Dowie wasn't a um, person who didn't have the complete understanding of that office as an apostle, the anointing that he carried. Um, it just pierced the religious theocracies of his day. But there were a few who did understand him, and as a result, he misunderstood several administrations that came with the passion of his office. One passion was in the area of politics. Dowie is, um, his leadership was gaining a strong national influence and this particular society called the Temperance Society asked him to run for uh, parliament, that's in Australia, they call it parliament, and um, an office there. And so he got involved, he put his preaching aside, his teaching, divine healing, everything, and put everything in running for office. He got political. At first he opposed the idea, but later he changed his mind thinking he could possibly influence more in the political arena than in the religious one. He suffered a sound defeat in the election. The local newspapers that had been so damaged by his ministry wasted no, all, all, they, they went a full attack against him. Um, but here's where Dowie went off the rails, mixing ministry with politics. That's not what he was called to do. But after that defeat, um, he finally, in 1880, returned to preaching the message of divine healing with great physical and spiritual blessings that coming to him as a result. The gifts of the Spirit began to manifest in his life and revelation about, about it as well. Um, he received it like never before. Thousands were being healed under his ministry. Persecution abounded even to the point that his enemies in organized crime um, schemed to murder him. Now, I'm not, uh, there's a lot to this, but for instance, um, when, you're pre they're, they're, when you're preaching the gospel and, and, and signs and wonders are happening and people are getting healed, it's going to affect others, whether you're in the mob, whether you're in the political. When the kingdom of God is being manifested, there's going to always be groups, whether they're religious groups or worldly groups, that are not going to like what you're doing because he was against alcohol tobacco, um, big time. I mean, he made it his thing to go after um, those entities. And so mobs, of course, that's how they, prohibition at that time, all that. So obviously he's created enemies. Now this is what they did. So they planted a bomb in his desk to go off. He didn't know that. So he's in his office. Now, he probably lives about two blocks away from his office, but he's in his office late at night and something said, get out. And he just ignored it. He's like, I don't know what that is. So he just kept working, and he heard it again. Leave. And this time it came with such force, he grabbed his coat, and he went home. And he finished working at home. But while he was at home, later that night, the bomb exploded, and they placed it under his desk. Now, I'm just giving you the background. Wait till you see where this goes. How much this man was persecuted um, like Donald Trump is being persecuted today from the secular world as well as you know enemies in the religious world and some of the things they did and wait till we, we I'm just setting you up so don't get bored this gets really exciting otherwise if he's a boring person I'm not gonna I mean his life is very colorful and it's controversial but there's a lot here so anyway so the gifts of the Spirit began to manifest in his life, and revelation uh, began to happen. Thousands were being healed under his ministry. Persecution abounded even to the point, again, the desk. 
And in 1888, Dowie sensed the unction to come to America and possibly into England. This became a reality in June of that year as he passed under the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Newspaper articles carried the story that Dowie was heading for America and the people were coming from all parts of California to be healed. It's, and the reason why is because he was wrote a lot about in, in, in other countries, their newspapers, and then we would pick up the story and run it. So he was well known over here before he even got here because he was controversial on, in, um, in Australia and Scotland. So um, soon Dowie began healing crusades up and down the coast of California. And it was during this time that he met Maria Woodworth Edder, which we're going to look at her maybe next week. And um, she was also a great woman, a healing evangelist, but they had a conflict. And so here we go with how this kind of stuff happens in, in um, Christianity or religion, whatever you want to call it, but in the church. But here's what happened. He thought he was the only one who had the healing ministry because they didn't have radio. They didn't have television. They didn't have a lot. So he, he didn't see anybody else doing it. This was his burden when he read in Acts chapter 10, verse what, 38, that Jesus went about healing. He says, why isn't he healing today? Remember, he, he, ha, he saw the sickness and suffering in the hospital that he was a chaplain at. He carried that sickness for a long time, and God healed him, and that gave him the impetus to go out there and preach that healing message, and then God began to start using him in that healing ministry. So, But he didn't hear of anybody else doing it, because again, you don't, you don't have a lot of that media that we can see what others are doing. So when he heard about this lady, Maria Woodworth Edder, um, ministering he saw what she did and she was more led by the spirit than he was and here her method that wasn't the way he did it and so he just denounced her and every chance he got he crucified her in public because he just thought he was the only one rather than learn from her her from him they could have probably ministered to each other been accountable to each other or, hey we're, but this is something new it is this is so new that they're going to put him in jail for practicing medicine. That's how many people were getting healed. We'll get to that here in a minute. But right now he's, he's at odds with um, Maria Woodworth Edder. She was a great woman, a healing evangelist, and they had a conflict with each other, her method of ministry. Dowie crucified her every chance he got. Edder's method of ministry made, made um, Dowie uneasy because he didn't understand it, but he never took the time to speak with her privately about it either. Also, um, like I said, she moved in the Holy Spirit in ways that he didn't. Dowie toured the, um, toured the regions of America and eventually chose to settle in Evansville, Illinois, outside of Chicago. This is where he'll end up. The Chicago newspaper bitterly attacked him, calling him a false prophet and imposter. The, um, they declared that he was um, not wanted in Chicago. Nevertheless, he stayed in Chicago. Now, here's what's happening. Once he got there, he was speaking on divine healing in a convention, and he was summoned to pray for a lady dying from a tumor. Now, he said, Lord, if you heal this woman, then I'm supposed to set my headquarters up in Chicago. And nevertheless, he, you know, she got healed, and he stayed in Chicago. And um, at this time, Chicago was the second largest city in America, and there were evil spiritual influence um, in Chicago, and but he established his headquarters there anyway. So he began to pray for this woman. She gets healed, and so the newspapers pick up on it, and he, he realizes this is where he's supposed to be. And this is at the time the World's Fair was to open, and that was a big thing in Chicago during that time. But he was not allowed. They wouldn't let him preach divine healing in this fair. He wanted to go in the fair and set up some type of a, what do you call it? Tent. tent and you know and preach healing or whatever they said no but they would let D.L. Moody who was also alive at that time and he was an evangelist they let him in there to preach the gospel but they didn't want Dowie in there doing any healing now if he, if he wasn't healing why would they keep him out they didn't want no healing going on there and you're going to see why here in a minute so what he did was he pitched a tent <laughs> outside of right outside of the um of the world fair 
and he, be, and he called it tabernacle, Zion Tabernacle or something like that. And he began to preach divine healing and, and the crowds went to him. And, and he, again, people were being healed. The newspapers frantically formed a list of allies against him and ministers to paralyze his ministry and to tarnish his work. To their dismay, the constant articles and unrelenting slander only caused his work to increase. By now, hundreds of people flooded the city of Chicago to attend daily services. As a result, um, lodging was difficult to come by, so he opened up large rooming board houses called healing homes. And this is probably where, well, when we get to John G. Lake, he had healing rooms as well. But what Dowie would do is he would go, I think he had about 13 homes he had built. They were in a Victorian style. They were three stories. And what it was for was anybody the hospital couldn't heal. They had no place to go, but they were still sick and suffering. He brought them over there where he would just immerse them in the Word of God. And they would pray and heal them and so forth and so on. But that's about 13 of these homes. Now this was obviously happening and working. And the sick could come there and rest until the manifestation of healing. Now the newspaper called these healing rooms lunatic asylums. Because of these healing homes, his enemies <coughs> thought they found a vulnerable spot so in, eight, in his ministry. So in 1895, they arrested him on the charge of practicing medicine without a license. So he's in jail. He's fined. He gets, a, he gets two brilliant attorneys. And he doesn't hire them to um, speak for him. He says, you, you advise me on these legal matters. So he goes before the judge. And they say, now, here's the deal. You get on the Internet, you're going to see the, um, the document of what the judge asked him, how he responded, and it is amazing. I mean, it's like you're there. And um, he was brilliant. He was superior. He, they could not get him. The questions they asked... If we had time, we, we, I, could, I could show it to you. But it's, you, if you're interested, just do a, do a YouTube search on his name. Anyway, so what happened was that the, he, he, he basically won the case, but the judge was against it. Because, again, it's, it's, you know, that's how that stuff works. If the judge doesn't like you and he's involved in the, in the corruption of the city, they're going to railroad you, and that's what they did. So he went to a higher court. So going to a higher court... They dismissed it because they said there was no grounds for them. What had happened was every time he got arrested over 100 times, they just kept arresting him for, even though the courts did what they did, they kept arrest. So it got, to, it got so playful that at the end of his message, he'd go out the side door and walk into the paddy wagon and be taken to jail. And so they did everything they could to stop this man from having a ministry and preaching divine healing in Chicago. And, um, but anyway, so the court ended up finding him that he, that, um, that he was, was that, that they, could, they couldn't put him in jail anymore and all that. But he, so basically, um, he thrived on all this persecution. Having foiled the legal system, his enemies then plotted to take away his mailing privileges. So it wasn't enough. Now, they didn't win on getting him, you know, in jail for practicing without medicine without license. Now they try to go after his mailing because that's where your money was. Remember last week we talked or two weeks ago we talked about that lady taking the mailing list and that kind of just stopped all the money from coming in because that's the only way you, you raise money is through your mailing list. And so he had this magazine called Healing Leaves. And so the, he had a um, a sec so what they did, they, these guys went to the postmaster general of Chicago. They knew that this guy was a devout Catholic. So they took um, this guy, one of, his, one of Dowie's sermons that renounced the infallibility of the Pope, and the postmaster was instantly offended and revoked his second-class mailing privileges, forcing Dowie to pay 14 times the usual cost. So he does it, he pays it. But that he would, but he's going to pay that. But he's going to tell all his listeners to to write into Washington D.C. the postmaster there. You got to go to a, you got to go up higher. Who's higher than the postmaster in Chicago? You got to go to D.C. So anyway, it happens. People are, are writing in to what? So he gets an audience with the postmaster general in Washington D.C. 
Once Dowie shares his story with the postmaster, what the postmaster in Chicago is doing to him, and showed him all the malicious lies printed in the Chicago newspaper, of the editor in the paper, um, the U.S. government denounced what they were doing and he won his case. But here's the kicker. Not only did he win the case, while he's there, he gets an audience with William McKinney, who's the president of the United States. And so while he's there, he gets this prophetic word that if you don't, you guys aren't guarding the president, because there's no secret service back then, he's unguarded. And he got a word that if you don't guard this guy, he will be assassinated. <coughs> So he began to tell um, his, his viewers, pray for the president. He's unguarded. And if they don't fix this, he's going to be assassinated. Well, guess what? He was assassinated in, uh, I think, New York, Buffalo, New York, or whatever. And um, so, again, there's some legitimacy there. So um, by the end of 1896, he had gained great influence over the city of Chicago, and his enemies were either dead in prison or silenced. The local police that had once arrested him over a hundred times became his friends. And, but what had happened was, people were, his, his congregation was growing so much that they were putting, the votes of his people were putting the particular mayor, mayors in office and, and police chiefs and all that. And so he, it, the tide was turning for him. And um, everybody... He just got to the place now where it just flipped. All the persecution now became favor, but it didn't last long. Um, soon there was scarcely a person in Chicago who had not heard the gospel message. He was praying for thousands every week to receive divine healing. Among those being healed that were notable was this lady called Amanda Hicks. She got healed, and she's the cousin of Abraham Lincoln. John G. Lake's wife gets healed. A U.S. congressman wife gets healed. This is bringing great credibility to this man. So that's what I'm saying. This stuff's documented. This is not some, there were divine healings, thousands happening through this guy's ministry. Through his apostolic mantle, John Alexander Dowie literally ruled the city of Chicago for Jesus Christ. He leased the largest auditorium in Chicago for six months and moved the great Zion Tabernacle into the building, filling its 6,000 6, seats every service. And I think you have a picture of that there. Might be hard to see from where you're at. but um. wow. So the next three years were quiet, prosperous, and influential. It was during this time that Dowie made his secret plans for his special city. Now, plans were being made for building the city of Zion, Illinois. What he wanted to do, and this is where he goes off the rails again, is that it wasn't enough to just do what he was doing with the results that he was getting. He wants to get and build a city in Chicago. So he buys all this land. To make a long story short, he actually builds a city. 20,000 people are in this city. It has a fire department. It has a library. It has everything that a city has, but the problem was he ran every aspect of it. Talk about micromanaging. He ran the finances of it. He, ran, he, wrote, he was able to write checks out of the income of everything that came in, and so it got really weird. And um, again, do you know how hard it is to run a church when it gets big like that? He's running a city, and he's got his hands on every aspect of it. So he's not really giving it any more time to divine healing. What his apostolic mantle, what he was called to do, he's not giving any time to, to it because this thing is actually working. And he thinks that he can make a city that's sinless, that has no tobacco, no alcohol, because that was his big thing. That was his big campaign. So he unveiled his architectural plans January 1st, 1900. And he bought land, began building subdivisions and so forth and so on. People began to start moving. And like I said, it came to end up being 20,000 people. Um, now, what, here's where the tragedy begins to happen. This, let me, before I get to the tragedy, let me tell you this. Do you realize that when he was so successful in building this city, 
that he was talking to the Turkish government who had owned the land where the mosque in Jerusalem is right now and he was planning on buying the land where the temple was because this is in 19 this is in 1900 and so Israel hadn't even become a nation until 1948 so he'd already began to think about buying that land and building a temple there for the return of Jesus Christ and if you go to a, I don't, can't remember the museum you can look it up but to this day there is in a museum his blueprints of how and what he was going to do in Jerusalem. So, I mean, this guy had vision, whether that's right or wrong, well, I don't prescribe to it, but um, he had vision and he made things happen because here's the problem. When you have an apostolic anointing, it's governmental, but it's not governmental for worldly affairs, it's governmental for the church. And he got mixed up. His anointing, he, he was using it for the world rather than for what the Lord had called him to do with it. And so it, when you compromise like that, pastors, it, it's the same thing with pastors. They, 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 they're going to preach and teach and make disciples. Then what happens? The church starts growing. Then they become a CEO of a big business. They're no longer discipling people. Their they're every day is administrative, strategy, programs, this, that. And they're not praying. They're not reading. They're not seeking. They're not fulfilling. They think they can juggle both. But God didn't call you to be a CEO. He called you to be a preacher. And this is where churches today, they, they don't, don't blame him for what he did because pastors do it every day. This is a common thing in pastors. When the church starts growing, the ministry starts going. It's not about the people anymore. It's about the building. It's about administration. It's about numbers. It's about money. And then they lose touch with the people. And they're no longer, they're, they're, whatever they're anointed to do, it starts going by the wayside and they become big businessmen and it happens all the time and they don't see it they see it as success and they pump that thing even more because it happened to me I was the pastor of a large church and I sat behind that desk one day and said man all I am is a CEO of a big business this is not this cannot be and this is not what God meant church to be it, sh it just shouldn't get this big because all you're going to do is troubleshoot every single day. There's all You get that many people, you're going to have a lot of problems because people don't get along. Huh? Yeah. I mean, you always hear about people fighting, church splits, and so forth and so on. So he just took it to another level. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to do this. I can build a city and... and, and if, and make it all about the, the city and, the, and, and, and so forth. So um, so anyway, we get to the place now where um, the city of Zion, that was the name of it, um, was broke. It finally financially starts going down wayside. And um, he ends up going to California where there was a... He's staying there. He's still part of it, but he, he goes on this tour. Now, during this time, his daughter, who's 21 years old, she, this is, this is one of the tragedies in his life, she's 21 years old, and she's got a curling iron. And this is probably 1902. So, in 1902, she's got a curling iron, she's 21 years old, and it is, there's a lamp with alcohol, and I, I don't know how that works, but it, it, the alcohol, the lamp, heated the, the curling iron. Well, she knocked over the, the lamp and the alcohol. It caught fire. It went all over her, and she had such severe burns, she ended up dying from those um, severe burns. And so that was a, a setback for him. And so what he did, he needed to get away. So he ended up going to California where there was um, a severe drought happening as he was ministering. And um, during this time, too, let me just back up a minute before we get to California. Here's his other tragedy. Is that because he was so successful, and people put him on a pedestal, and he thought way more of himself, what pride comes before what? So his ego got big because people were coming to him, how great thou art, you know. And um, a rumor started happening. And they went to him and said, we believe you're Elijah, the one that was prophesied to come. And he, he, he just said, get out of here. But it got in him. 
he started thinking about it. Started looking at all the works. Now, now <laughs> this is, I, I was not going to use this picture. And I thought, and I was going to tell him, don't use this picture unless he shows up. Because, dude, you're reincarnated. That's who, that's you. That looks just like you. <laughs> the reincarnation of Hollywood. But anyway, um, he took, he really believed he was Elijah. And that was probably 1903, around the time that his daughter died. Um, so for, for a few years, um, it, and it messed everything up. So he goes to California, and there's a severe drought. And it hasn't rained for eight months. And so they, the newspapers, reporters come and say, since you're Elijah, do what Elijah did. Call it to rain. Well, he prays, and it rains. Now, you can do with that with what you want. Again, newspapers are involved and when you get on and, and you get on YouTube and look I mean it's a plethora of newspaper articles it's like they couldn't stop writing about this guy he wants to go to see what it would I just need to see what it looks like me. <laughs> hey I'm in the middle of a service here man what is he doing that's you now look at the camera and let them see you when he had that long beard I don't know it's you <laughs> so anyway, um, you do with that with what you want, but the fact is, this is the grace of God, okay? So, you know, people have written him off as an imposter, and, but you, his last seven years, you cannot judge that man on his last seven years when I just showed you, I mean, they have crutches and wheelchairs all over the place where people walked out of that, that, those services healed. And so, you know, when you get to Catherine Coleman and Amy Sybil McPherson, they're weird, okay? And people judge them on their theatrics, on their idiosyncrasies, but rather than saying, but oh, well, it's the, it's the work of the devil. Um, the devil is the one who makes people sick, not the one who heals them. And... Um, so you can, you know, again, that's 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 a cop out. That's that's the devil doing all that stuff because you know, you'll know them by their fruit. Well, he believed in Jesus. He preached Jesus. He preached salvation. He preached it harder than than most people do. Um, he just got delusional with that Elijah thing, and he got away from his calling and and built that city, and that was the beginning of the end. His last seven years are not going to go very well. Of course, his daughter, that didn't help at all. Um, so while he's in California, he's away from the Zion, the, the, the city, and they decide they don't want him back because he's losing it. And so they kick him out. When he gets there, he fights in the court system to get his place back, but they never happen. But they do let him stay in the house that he was building called Shiloh that his daughter never really got to go into. It was like almost being done because they were living in an apartment. But, um, so he ends up going there with his wife, moving in. He lost the city, though they let him stay there in the house that he was building. But one of the things that, um, that I find interesting is that, well, let me just tell you that he dies in 1907 from a stroke. And so um, 60 years old, from um, 1847, I believe, to what, 19, go back to that. Uh, is it on the first, mm -hmm. the first slide? Um, 1847 to 1907. So um, it's not very, he's not very, very old. Now his wife will go on to live till 1936. So she'll, she, she will have lost her husband and her daughter and will, be, and will live another 20 some years. So um, it's, a sad, it's a sad ending, but if you, like again, if you get on YouTube and look, up, look him up, They'll go back and show you where he lived, shows you the house, shows you everything. And he, um, I don't know if you, you probably haven't heard of a guy named Gordon Lindsay. He had a magazine. He did all the healing evangelists and wrote on him. He was born in Zion as a kid when this guy had the city. And so he wrote a whole book on Dowie, and it's really good. I think you can only get it now on Kindle. But, um, and it's a good book to read about him. So... Um, what I find interesting is he dies in 1906, 
Now, if you remember, the Welsh Revival was from 1904 to 1906. And the Azusa Street Revival was from 1906 to all, about three and a half years, 1910. So he never, ever went that route, though he was in California. That revival was going on, and he never attended. He never said anything about Evan Roberts and the Welsh Revival, but Charles Parr. Remember Charles Parr? Who was friends with William Seymour? Remember William Seymour had. Remember he was had the Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, and they moved it to Houston, Texas. Remember William Seymour was outside, who couldn't because of the color of his skin, couldn't listen to the. Remember all that? Well, he invited Charles Parham when when Seymour had the Zuzu Street happening, and um, the first time he said no, I'm not going to come out and speak at Zuzu because I'm going up to Zion to listen to the Dowie. What I'm trying to show you, because we're going to look at Charles Parham too, what I'm trying to show you is the, the dots that are, that are connected. John G. Lake, um, Gordon Lindsay being born there, F.F. Um, F. Bosworth, who was influenced by Dowie, his brother, um, Charles Parham, and the, the fact that he um, did not like Mary Woodworth Edder. She, wait till we get to her. She's got some crazy things happening in her life. Um, Amy Simple McPherson is going to be alive at that time. So we've got a lot of players <clears throat> happening right now. That's why I'm trying to do the ones that are living at the same time and they're, they're crossing each other's paths or at least that they're, they're alive at the same time. Because God is moving in, 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 in during that time. And the sad thing is, um, it's sad that the church sees their differences and crucifies each other over the differences rather than saying, hey, look, let's, let's, let's accept what's happening because something's definitely happening. I mean, they didn't realize in that era that the Spirit of God was just moving versus today. What do we have going on today? We had a revival in Kentucky. It didn't have long-lasting results like some of these revivals did or huge manifestations of miracles that, that were taking place. I'm not dem demeaning that revival at all. I'm just simply saying um, they didn't know what they had. They didn't, I mean, maybe they did, but they sure didn't steward it because they were dividing from each other. They were fighting. They were bickering over methods, styles, color of skin. I mean, it's just, rather than, like, like Evan Roberts, steward the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit move. Now, let me just reiterate why I'm, I'm doing um, these, these messages uh, you know, and showing you the faults. Because if you look at Evan Roberts, he's a nobody. He's a nobody. He's just working in the coal mines at the age of 12 because he doesn't have, his parents don't have enough money to send him to school. So he's, he's working in the coal mines. And then you got the William Seymour, who's a black guy, can't even go to school because of the color of his skin. He's a nobody. He's just he, you know, that's a, that's that black guy out there um, in the in the yard listening to listening to the. Who are these guys? Nobody. And um, so when you look at these people, like even um, Dowie, he he was just a kid with a sickness, and shoe first job was the shoe factory. But you just, you just keep trusting God, you keep relating to God, and God creates the opportunities. And it's like in Daniel 11, it says, God searches, the, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to strongly support those whose hearts are completely His. So if your heart is His, He's not looking at your morality, He's not looking at your sins, because Christ took care of all of that. He's looking for people that have a heart to do what He has a heart to do on earth. So when you say on earth as it is in heaven, God's heart is starts in heaven and he wants to unfold it on earth through our hearts so when our hearts align with his hearts and we're on the same page called union that's what happens with union we start hearing his heart and we start taking on his heart and our hearts are one and we start doing what his heart is that's why these these things is lord what are you doing the question is not your lifestyle although you know you don't want to go out and be an idiot but it's about lord what are you doing <clears throat> And I want to know what you're doing, and I want to do, and I want to be involved in that which you're doing. And then let the Holy Spirit have his way. But what are, we, we can't be, you know, again, I, I hope this stirs us and ignites in us that you've got to quit looking in the mirror and may, saying, I, who am I? 
That is exactly what the devil wants. That's exactly religion keeping you down. And so if you do that and you continue to do that, you're playing right into the thing. God is looking for people that he can raise up to heal the sick and yes, raise the dead. Do you think that's not going to get the attention of the world? This man got the attention of the medical establishment because he was healing people that they couldn't, and they didn't like that. He's building a city and doing things that the people that were elected to do couldn't do. And so he got all this persecution because he was doing the work that the world couldn't do. So that's why it was relentless persecution from the medical field, from the city officials, from the religious sect, the whole thing was against him in Chicago, but he prevailed. He got off the rail, but I'm telling you, this is a story that no matter what the government or the world or the devil throws at you, if you keep your heart and, and align with God's heart, meaning that you're about what he's doing, nothing can stop you. Because there's a man right there who could not be stopped. He stopped himself. Isn't it amazing that... The, the newspapers couldn't stop him. The postmaster couldn't stop him. The medical establishment couldn't stop him. The church couldn't stop him, but he stopped himself. He became his worst enemy. But that's a good illustration right there that when you're doing God's will, and it's all about God, not yourself, and again, you've got to read that, that when that, that judge was trying to set him up in that make, putting, to put him in jail for practicing medicine, the wording and the way he responded, it was the Holy Spirit on him, man. So, if, if God be for you, who could be against you? But you can't not sit there any longer, and again, we haven't even scratched the surface of these pioneers of the faith. And you start seeing what these ordinary people with no education, born on the wrong side of the tracks, not the right skin color, can do, and we're way ahead of them talk about privilege, but we're way more ahead of them. And what are we doing? What are we doing? We're going to be accountable to that. You've got Christ in you who's just dying to do the will of the Father in the area of praying for people, preaching to people. And what are we doing? So we've got, we got, we got to really ask ourselves. So again, when we appear before God, I mean, it's, He's a God of mercy and grace. He's, you know, don't get me wrong, but... Wow, I mean, we got to appear before him, and we're going to like, what did, you, what did you do with everything I've given you? I've given you my son. He's inside of you. What did you do with him versus what you did apart from him? You made a lot of stuff we did apart from him, and how much stuff have we, will we have done with him? Any questions or comments? I have something to share uh, today I sold a product to a guy last week and I asked him how it worked he said I, I can't use it because my asthma that I have it it uh, it flares it up so I, I I took the product back but anyway I was driving down the road a couple hours later and it came to me he said my asthma which he's owning yeah. what he has and then to it, God brought it to me that it can only come from one or two, either him or the enemy. So if you're going to own something, God's not here to make us sick or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he's owning something that he doesn't need. You know, that's what we do with ourselves. We own things. When something comes to our mind, then we think, well, that's what I am or that's who I am. And that's identity. Yeah. yeah. Unrenewed mind. Yep. And that's how the enemy keeps us where we're at. And we'll never get beyond what we're thinking. As a man thinks, so he is. Yeah, That's true. Yeah, that's why I always say, it says, uh, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak. Because I believe, I know your words have a lot of power. So even if you're thinking it, don't say it if it's something that's going to harm or do something. Because that gives, I yeah, believe well, that gives. Say what the Lord, what the Bible says. Speak what the scriptures say over over you, what the situation is. You know, pr speak promises. We are partakers of his divine nature and, and his promises. All the promises are yes. So rather than speak what you're going through, speak the promise. 
And if you don't have one, say, Lord, give me a promise for this. What are you, what are you doing? Again, what are you doing? You Not what's happening to me, but what are you doing through me? And uh, big difference. Anything else? You got to get out of that mentality that it's not not me. Can't I, God won't use me? That's it. No, you know what? So you're not going to be used. You're not going to have a church that big that He had. But listen, if you if you if you heal, and God uses you to heal, healing healing through you, or minister or whatever it is, even if it's just a handful, you're being responsible with being here. If you don't do that, I, I've got to say, if, we, if we're not part of what God's doing, then we became very egotistical and we made this whole thing about us. Ourself. And man, that is, that is so ugly. That is just not what he came to do, is to give us a life to make it about ourselves. He's in us for others. Um, to destroy the works of the devil. That's what it says in 1 John 3, 8, that Jesus was manifested... To destroy the works of the devil. Well, he left. So I guess the works of the devil can continue, right? <laughs> I guess the devil won. He died. Left. No. He came back in us. Now it's us destroying the works of the devil. And that's what we need to be about. Father, we bless you. We thank you. These men aren't perfect. These women aren't perfect. But God, what are we learning? We've got to glean from their lives the good and avoid the bad and learn. That, God, you use those whose hearts are completely yours. And that's what you're looking for, the heart. And those who trust you and believe you for what you say and what you're doing and accomplishing. That our hearts are your hearts as one. And we feel what you feel. And we want to manifest what you're doing on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.